It began back in May this year when a startling video emerged showing something that nobody expected to see in Moscow. It would be a pretty remarkable breach of Russian air defences for a drone like that to fly all the way across the country and hit the Kremlin. Two drones were seen flying over the Kremlin, the headquarters of the Russian president. Within minutes, there was a small explosion. Nobody was injured. And then, a few weeks later, there was another drone attack in Moscow. Russian TV says this is the moment that Moscow came under attack. From early morning, people in and around the Russian capital reported hearing explosions. And yesterday, Moscow awoke to a fresh round of drone strikes, one narrowly missing Russia's defence ministry. Russia has accused Ukraine of launching a drone attack on Moscow. Russia's defence ministry says two drones hit non-residential buildings, with one crashing close to its headquarters in the city centre. No casualties have been reported. Although the drone attacks on Moscow feel new, over the past year, we have seen Russia being directly targeted in other ways too through assassinations on Russian territory and damage to the country's infrastructure. Drones hitting the Kremlin, blowing up the Kerch Bridge, linking Russia to Crimea, attacks by sea drones on Russian shipping in Sevastopol, and several assassinations. These attacks have been a blow to Russia and to Russian morale. And the Kremlin are so furious about them that they've started a blame game. Russia tonight blaming the US for the alleged drone attack on the Kremlin, claiming without any evidence that such an attack would be, quote, dictated to Kyiv from Washington. We don't attack Putin or Moscow. We fight on, on our territory. It appears as if Russia is getting targeted inside Russia. Who is perpetrating it? We don't know. But there is one man who the Kremlin believes to be the mastermind behind it all. He is the head of Ukraine's intelligence, the GUR, and Russia wants him dead. Is it tiring living with that threat the whole time? It's a lot Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's like a compliment for me. Uh, it's like a medal, if you want. He's a man who considers it a medal, a badge of honour, a huge compliment that Russia keeps trying to assassinate him. And it won't stop him taking the war back to them. It's a real projection of power by the GUR back into Russia, a message to Russia, you cannot have this war on your terms inside Ukraine. It's coming back at you. You're listening to Stories of Our Times from The Times and The Sunday Times. I'm Manveen Rana. Today, meet the Ukrainian spymaster who is Putin's prime target. My name's Anthony Lloyd and I'm a special correspondent for The Times. Anthony, you've just been in Ukraine where you managed to have a meeting with a man who's pretty much a legend now in that country. This is Major General Kirillo Budinov. Tell us, where did you have to go to meet him? So I met him on Rybalsky Island, which is where the headquarters of the GUR, the Military Intelligence Directorate of Ukraine, are headquartered. So it's in Kyiv and it's a small river island which you get over uh, over a bridge and there's kind of industrial area there and a few kind of flyovers and all the rest of it it took a bit of time to arrange this meeting it was the first time we had met but i was really curious to know his views on some of the aspects of the war and he in himself is a very interesting character well Tell us about that. I mean, what were your first impressions of meeting him? Because, you know, when you went to meet him, he was supposedly a dead man. Yes, at the end of May, there was a double missile strike on the headquarters. And the Russians seemed very confident 
that they'd either killed Budanov or wounded him so badly that he was comatose and had allegedly been evacuated to a NATO hospital in Germany. And Russian military bloggers kept repeating this with a great degree of confidence. And Putin smirked on air on TV, I think a day or two after the strikes on the Rybalsky Island headquarters, that there had been a precision strike against the GUR there. So as far as they're concerned, he's dead? As far as they were concerned, he had been hit and he was very seriously injured or dead. And more curious was that Budanov, who speaks out quite often, suddenly went into total silence. In the middle of this kind of three-week silence, a very strange video appeared without obviously a date stamp of him sitting at his desk, staring at the camera, saying nothing, with just the caption, plans love silence. Plans love silence. So this is this is the great intelligence master yeah. plotting away in silence. Yeah, but also there's no way of telling... When that was shot, he didn't say anything. He didn't refer no. to being struck. So the Russians are like, he's definitely dead now. Look, you know, this is old footage being conjured up. And I wasn't even sure when I applied to see him. I was like, well, I wonder if he is in hospital in Berlin or not. But then one day I was told to go to Rybalski Island and there he was, very much alive. And, and certainly him, yeah. He's pretty unmistakable. Well, tell us in what way unmistakable? What is he like to meet as a person? Well, first of all, he's pretty young for a spy master. He's 37 years old. One US intelligence official likened uh, Budanov as George Smiley meets Jason Bourne, the intelligence of Smiley and the violence of Jason Bourne. His office is very dark. It's very shadowy. And you can see he's been wounded a lot. There's a slight stoop there and damage to his arm. He's had his elbow joint blown out or shattered. He's got a piece of shrapnel near his heart. These are legacy wounds, man. This wasn't the May strike. This is stuff that happened a few years ago in Donbass wow. when he was on special operations. When you meet him, you said his office is quite dark. Just describe the scene. I'm invited in. He's standing, standing he's by his desk, shake hands and sit down. Now the desk is this really eclectic scatter of stuff. There was everything there was... There's loads of owls. Owls are the emblem of the GUR. When you say owls, are these like little statues of owls? There's little pictures? statues of owls. There's big statues of owls. There's medium statues of owls. And behind his desk, there is a huge painting of an owl, wings outspread, clutching a bat. Now, the bat is a symbol of his Russian opponent intelligence organisation, the GRU. Oh. So he's sitting there with this huge spread, spread wing owl with a bat in his talons. Then as well, there are, yes, the samurai sword, there's a grenade launcher, there's a hand grenade on his desk. There's a chessboard there. I counted at least six phones, but I think there were more than that. <laughs> and best of all, I noticed this dark tank. There's no light on in it. The room's quite shadowy anyway. And then this very pallid kind of frog drifted out of the gloom. And then another one. And it just really added to the whole atmosphere of the place, this world of secrecy, this gloom, and suddenly these pallid frogs are sort of emerging up against the side of the tank and then disappearing back into darkness. And then you've got this guy sitting behind his desk. It's everything you'd want from a spy master. There's a chessboard there because that's obviously key. Oh, he likes his chess too, yeah. <laughs> there are owls everywhere. That's their symbol. And then, as you say, the samurai sword and the, the rocket launcher, all these things which are much more military and much more about action than you'd imagine from an intelligence man. Oh, this guy is into action. It's very interesting, all the things that have occurred on his watch since he's been head at the GRU, since he's been director, the boss man. I'll put it this way, the war has been taken very much outside of the borders of Ukraine and into Russia and elsewhere. Now, he did say to me absolutely directly that he loves direct action. And he said it in a very chilling way as well. We use the direct actions. We love them. We love direct action. We're good at it. We do it. We will do it in the world where we see fit against whoever. So this is clearly a very influential man. Just give us a sense of what his role is and how he got there. What's his background? He started off in training to be um, a paratrooper originally in 2007 in Ukraine. 
But then before he, he passed out of his military academy, he went off to join the intelligence services, the GUR. He'd been there for three years, 2020, he attracted Zelensky's attention as being, you know, smart, out-of-the-box thinker. This is a guy who is trained to be a para, but then became a spy, but not a spy as we know it. I mean, it's like an, an armed action spy who has been wounded and grievously as well. I mean, the, the bit of shrapnel I think he took near the heart, that was in the Donbass some years ago where someone hit an anti-personnel mine and it really badly wounded Budanov in the neck, I think shoulder, and a bit went into his heart. And he had to walk, I think, five kilometres, really badly wounded to get out of it. So this is a guy who's a fighter as well as a thinker and quite an angry man. When you hear him talk about direct action operations against the Russians, by which he means, as I understand it, assassination, this is a guy who likes his work and wants to make Russia bleed. Now, the GUR, it's not like MI6 or MI5. They're totally different, totally different. Oh, really? In, yeah. In what way? Because they're much more hands-on. It's traditional intelligence, highly militarised intelligence, running assassination campaigns as well, special forces operations, and when the need arises, putting heavily armed groups into the field to do battle. Wow. So this is MI6 and the SAS and even a bit of intercept stuff all rolled into one. All rolled into one. And may I add as well, he was kind of alone in 2021 within the Ukrainian leadership of warning that the Russian invasion was imminent. In the autumn of 2021, there were a lot of people, including Zelensky, who really didn't appear to believe that the Russian invasion was imminent. Budanov yeah. was saying it is imminent. So he's certainly been proved right. He's been proved right, not with everything. I mean, there is, you know, there are contentious things. He says that Vladimir Putin is terminally ill with cancer. The Americans have come and said, no, we don't believe, or we haven't seen evidence to say that Putin's terminally ill. Last year, he said definitely the war would be over this year. Well, this year's still running, so we don't know, but it doesn't look like the war is going to finish anytime soon. I mean, I imagine intelligence chiefs all over the world probably change their opinions quite regularly. I suppose the difference with him is that he's so public about the things that he's warning. How has that sort of affected his reputation in Ukraine? I mean, I've seen him described in some articles as the Buddha, Budanov. <laughs> he has got a very, very high public profile. And, you know, there was a photographer who was working with me that day who took a couple of portraits of Budanov at his desk. People have taken portraits of him before and there's great sort of social media game in Ukraine to guess what the symbolism of everything on his desk means. I mean, I'm baffled. Well, samurai sword and frogs, you know, <laughs> it's quite a you know, psychiatric riddle. Some people say he has got political aspirations. Others say that it's just a very important part of controlling the information space for a spy master to appear as publicly as he does. Other people say, no, that's not the case, and he should be quieter. But um, he is a very, very well-known figure in Ukraine, widely admired by Ukrainians, particularly because, you know, they're on the end so often of drone strikes and missile strikes, and they see in Budanov a Ukrainian who is unafraid to take the war back into Russia. You mentioned that he said there had been several assassination attempts on his life by the Russians. Why do the Russians want him dead? Oh, because he does things which the Russians, or the Russians suspect him of being involved with things which really hurt them or really humiliate them. Since the invasion started, you've got numerous instances of direct action either in the Russian Federation or against Russian assets abroad. So those attacks have included the destruction of the Nord Stream pipeline, drones hitting the Kremlin, the blowing up of the Kerch Bridge linking Russia to Crimea, attacks by sea drones on Russian shipping in Sevastopol, and several assassinations. Probably don't know quite how many assassinations, but many, including that of the military blogger Vladlin Tatarsky and the bungled strike that was actually aimed at her father but ended up killing Daria Dugina, the daughter of a nationalist ideologue. On top of that, we got waves of mysterious kind of arson attacks on fuel depots and storage dumps, and as well, these long-range raids by Ukrainian-backed Russian dissident groups 
into Russia, coming out of Ukraine, armed and trained by Ukrainians and going to attack targets inside Russia. Now, that's quite a long checklist of direct action incidents, even if Budanov or the GUR are only responsible for a few of those. These are big operations. They cause the Russians a lot of internal angst, a lot of humiliation, a lot of anger. They see Budanov as the man behind a lot of these operations and they want to kill him. So, Anthony, Budanov is the youngest head of the Ukrainian intelligence service, the, the, the GUR, at a time when the country is at war. Just explain the role that the GUR has played in the war since they began and just how effective they've been. I think, first of all, looking at it from inside Ukraine, the, the direct action operations which are run by GUR inside Russia carries a huge emotional positive impact in the eyes of Ukrainians. You know, Ukrainians so often are on the end of drone strikes, missile strikes, air strikes. And for them to be aware that one of their own agencies is hitting back at Russia, inside Russia, is very, very popular amongst a lot of Ukrainians. I think there's a wider strategic awareness amongst many of the leadership in Ukraine that if this is a straight military contest between Ukrainian army and Russian army in eastern Ukraine in order to drive the Russians out of their country, then Ukraine probably isn't going to come up on top. It hasn't got the, the ratios of soldiers, of artillery, and certainly of air power are not in Ukraine's favour. But if that campaign is fought parallel to another campaign, a campaign that takes the war into Russia, that hits strategic targets like the Kerch Bridge, which is a real solar plexus point. The bridge links Crimea to Russia mainland. And there's been at least two strikes on that, the most recent one last week. The bridge is the most potent and most hated symbol of Russia's occupation of Crimea. Now the bridge has been damaged for the second time in 10 months. Putin is immensely proud of that bridge. An attack on the bridge is an attack on Putin himself. He will not be happy at all. These are real nerve points for Russia. So it's a real projection of power by the GUR back into Russia. A message to Russia, you cannot have this war on your terms inside Ukraine. It's coming back at you. And though he's never admitted, to my knowledge, to one assassination, including the assassinations of Russian propagandists, of military bloggers, some of the words that Budanov has put out, either to journalists or in statements following up on assassinations, make it very clear that the GUR were likely involved. And just give us a sense of some of the other more recent incidents that have happened that people have immediately thought that must be the GUR. There was an assassination of a guy called Stanislav Rzhitsky, who was 42 years old. He was a former submarine commander of a submarine called the Krasnodar. The Krasnodar submarine was involved on a missile strike in the Ukrainian city of Venezia last year, in which 23 civilians were killed. Now, Rzhitsky was gunned down as he was jogging in the city of Krasnodar, which is the same name as the uh, submarine. And he was shot multiple times. Now, this fits in exactly with the kind of assassination operations that the GUR allude to. And let's make no mistake as to how Budanov sees direct action operations. We are doing that right now, he told me. And he sounded really angry when he said that. We're doing that right now. While these inhumans are existing, we will be active. We use direct actions, we use them, and we love them. And humans are existing, we will be active. He said that to me just a week before Rzhitsky gets gunned down, the Russian submarine commander, in Russia. Immediately after the assassination, the Russians blame the GUR, and the GUR, Budanov's organisation, releases its own cryptic message. Due to heavy rain, the park was deserted. They're talking about the site of the assassination. So there were no witnesses who could provide details or identify the attacker. The GUR said, now those details would only be known if you were there in the park at 6am when the guy was shot. Oh. And it seems that Rzhitsky's runs, these morning runs, could be tracked on a Strava app, which is like a fitness app that he used to log running his app. running routes on. So... 
it looks like whoever killed him was working for an organization that knew how to track someone's app, physical activity via an app to put down a good operation, assassination operation when there was no one else around and get away with it. That's what it looks like. Now, whether the GUR was responsible or not, I don't know, but a pretty chilling statement from them afterwards. Anthony, recently a leak of US intelligence documents on the group chat platform Discord showed us a bit about what they knew was going on. And one of the really intriguing leaks showed that Evgeny Prigozhin, the head of the Wagner Group, the Russian mercenaries, was communicating with the head of the GUR, the Ukrainian intelligence, with Budanov, or certainly with his agency. What do we know about those links? I asked him directly about this because I was I was interested. The Discord links alluded to the fact that either Budanov or his guys, his officers, had met with Prigozhin in an undisclosed African country. So when I asked him about it, I won't be able to tell you anything about. He said, "Yeah, he said he wouldn't comment on the Discord leaks, but he said that he had engaged directly." Have we? Did he use the word faced? Yeah. Or, have, have we can't interact? Have interact. We, have we? You know, fought. We stopped you one more. Fought. Fought. Yeah, it, and uh, let me put it like that: we uh, um, met, which is a vague word again, uh, with them, with many in many African countries. So he said to me, "Have we faced with Wagner? Of course we did." So he was being cryptic. What does that mean? Well, he was being cryptic. I think he, what he meant is sometimes we meet and it's bang, 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 and sometimes we meet and it's talk, talk, talk. So that was an admission of engagement with the Wagner Group in African countries with the illusion to could have been talking, could have been fighting. So we don't know if he's met face-to-face with Prigozhin. We don't know. He's got this way of smiling where it's just one corner of the side of his mouth goes up and only a little bit and you're not quite sure. You don't want to look at it. You don't want to look at it too long. How that was going on when he was, he was talking me through that. But one thing that he did want to talk to you about were some le- Russian leaks that they'd managed to get their hands on. This is the Ukraine intelligence services had managed to get hold of some very important Russian documents. Tell us a bit about those. It seemed that GUR had managed to intercept a Russian analysis of public support inside Russia at the peak of the Wagner mutiny, vis-à-vis which regions were supporting Putin and which were supporting Prigozhin. The original analysis was done by the Russian Ministry of Internal Affairs, the MVD, which oversees all law enforcement and police activities in Russia. Now, the MVD, the Russians, had done this analysis. This was a secret analysis using basically social media intercepts. And the Russians have got huge powers and abilities in how they monitor Russian social media and what the sentiment analytics are on any given day. Sentiment analytics is a kind of new generation word for what people feel. And that's read according to what they're posting or what they're liking or how many hits they're getting on social media. So right. it's not a perfect art, but it's a pretty good art. And it was not good news. It proved that, OK, a majority of 21 Russian regions of 46 were supportive of Putin, but not far behind. 17 were supportive of Prigozhin. The other unnamed regions were split 50-50. And that's, wow. this is just areas within Russia outside in terms of republics, places like Dagestan, 97% of what the MVD could assess was supportive of Prigozhin. I mean, this is very anti-Moscow, anti-Putin. And then also Putin couldn't rely on the support of St. Petersburg, his own manner. Now, we can lose energy thinking, well, how did the GUR get hold of these intercepts? That's not so interesting. I mean, the spies, they can do that kind of stuff. Are they really true? Are those figures true? I don't know. Was it something that Budanov was trying to spin my way in order to make me believe something? I don't know. But what I do know is that Budanov believes that these figures suggest to him 
that Russia remains ripe for civil war and another crisis similar to the last one could lead to its implosion. But he also believes that's wow. something he wants to achieve because he thinks that would end the war in Ukraine, not make the situation worse, but end the war in Ukraine. So does he think it would take a civil war in Russia or for Putin to be pushed aside in some sort of coup? That's what it would take to end the war in Ukraine. That's what it would take for Ukraine effectively to win. Well, when we spoke about the ways the war could end, total victory for one side, total victory for another, but this kind of gridlock clinch of armies on the front, he didn't like that analogy, this clinch. And he absolutely spoke of the need for a solar plexus blow to Russia. And that wasn't going to happen on the zero point of the front line in eastern Ukraine. That was going to be something else, strategic targeting or the implosion of Russia. Do you think there's something in the idea that it'll be Budanov and the intelligence services who win this war rather than the military? I think it's absolutely insane that some people suggest that the Ukrainian military, with only a very little bit of time putting these heavy brigades together with new weaponry, learning how to coordinate and command and control without any air power, can retake the whole of Ukraine or break through a line in a significant way that makes the Russians fall back. And to expect that to work in a maximalist way, like resulting in a total victory for Ukraine and the expulsion of all Russian soldiers from all of Ukraine and Crimea, I think is ridiculously over-optimistic. If Russia can be made to suffer enough on the battlefield while parallel or something that gives it a real solar plexus blow, then it might be possible to get Russia meaningfully to a negotiating table. But for myself, and my own opinion, you know, I've spent quite a lot of time there in the last year and a half just to expect Ukraine to be able to do this solely conventionally on the battlefield, I think is a very tall order and very unlikely to happen. So the efforts of the intelligence services will be key. Strategic targeting, in-depth raids in Russia, you know, all the direct action campaigns from the Ukrainians' point of view, they will see that as absolutely critical into in wrong-footing Russia in ways that cannot be achieved by conventional force of arms on the battlefield. And Anthony, you talked about maximalist views of all of this. I mean, for Budanov, what would winning look like? What would a Ukrainian victory look like? He's unequivocal. For him, winning is a total victory, and that's all Russian forces out of Ukraine and Crimea and all of sovereign Ukraine back under the control of Kiev. That's his view. How he gets there is, is rather different to the point of view of some other people who saw relying on the Ukrainian military to kind of do it all, fight it all back. Budanov thinks there are other ways of doing it, and he clearly thinks that his lessons from the mutiny, from the Wagner mutiny, are that Russia, his enemy, is vulnerable on the inside, and that's something that he wants to exploit. Not everybody sees it like that. Some NATO powers are worried that Budanov's a hothead and he might antagonise a nuclear power. There are others who think that he's extremely effective, he has regular meetings with the CIA, but it was clear that he wasn't a big fan of every NATO. He said, I know who my allies are, but uh, not everybody in NATO is our allies. It was quite interesting. The NATO summit was coming up in Vilnius a few days after we met. And I mm. said to him, you know, are you expecting anything big there? And he, was, uh, he said, absolutely not. I do not expect the aspirations of the Ukrainian people to be met vis-a-vis -vis NATO membership. And he said, I know that's not going to happen because... I've seen all the draft speeches already, which I thought was quite funny. I mean, maybe that's not surprising for a spy chief to see the draft speeches, but I think it was quite funny. He was like, we're not going to get invited because I've seen the speeches. He really does have access to everything. So Anthony, for him, he can't rely on a military victory. He can't even rely on all of his NATO allies. There's a lot riding on him and what his organisation manages to achieve. Do you think he's got a chance of the kind of victory he's hoping for? I don't know. But one thing I do know is that I always say this war is ruled by the dynamic of chaos. It's not a, a simple equation of 
to mathematical size of sums of opposing forces and men and munitions. There are a whole lot of weird things into it which you can't quite qualify very easy, which is like emotion and will. But then there are also wild cards like the Wagner Group mutiny. Well, who saw that coming? There are incidents like that which just catch everybody by surprise that have ramifications way down the line. We still haven't seen all the fallout from the Wagner mutiny. We haven't seen how the, the sacking of some generals, the imprisonment of other generals is going to affect and is going to impact on Russian forces in Ukraine. There are a lot of wild cards out there. Budanov definitely represents the school of wild cards and it is a wild card that is more likely to win this war than a conventional force. You've been listening to Stories of Our Times, a podcast brought to you thanks to the subscribers of The Times and The Sunday Times, with me, Manveen Rana, and my guest, The Times foreign correspondent, Anthony Lloyd. If you're a subscriber, you can read more of his latest reporting from the war, including a powerful account of the forgotten widows of Ukraine. The producer today was Priyanka Deladia. The executive producers were Kate Ford and Edward Drummond, and sound design was by David Crackles. If you enjoyed this episode, please do leave us a review wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks for listening. See you tomorrow.